probably the most obvious quality, I'm not saying the most outstanding, but the most obvious was the incredible level of organization, note-taking, um, systematization of virtually everything in his life. There's a strong engineering gene in our family. Um, our whole German and Swiss sides are, which, there's an engineer in every generation, multitudes of engineers. Uh, they worked in the train systems in Switzerland and Germany, building basically the majority of the train systems. And so my father was basically an engineer in what he was doing. I mean, he, he would, you know, uh, he was like a large project manager, you know, he would, but he would develop the innovations, but then he would develop ways of implementing them and he would develop ways of evaluating them. And so, you know, he was really a genius in that um, and ways of disseminating the information and um, you know, getting people to come to his workshops. So he was really an engineer of his own, his own life, you know, his own work. I think perhaps he's one of the most deeply intuitive people I've ever known. Uh, I think he, he could see things, see the whole of things, and then he could kind of pull them apart into lists. I think that Wolfensberger's personality was uh, very important. Uh, in uh, his efforts to teach and to uh, 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 develop leaders and uh, to disseminate his work. I think he had a very strong, uh, wonderful personality uh, and exacting and, and challenging. To work with Wolf Wolfensberger was a pain in the ass. He never let you rest on your laurels. Uh, he never let you say something that you could not justify. Uh, if you ever question him, expect a diatribe. Um, and yet, he never lost sight of what he really wanted to accomplish and what he wanted you to accomplish. Wolf had conviction, and it took him a while to formulate those convictions. And after he formulated them, he never questioned his, uh, his uh, stand. Once he grabbed uh, onto, onto something, uh, once he grabbed onto an idea, and this is what we should be doing, this is what we should be saying, he wouldn't let go. He would not let go. That was another thing that I remember him, uh, Wolf, teaching, was how important it is to never compromise your values, that, you, that there are things that you can compromise, but, um, but that it's important to never forget you know, what, what the underpinnings are, and that whenever you do have to compromise, that you should never forget that you've made a compromise, to, to, you know, that, that that shouldn't become the norm. He, he was always very supportive once you got through the initial issue of who's in charge. And Wolf was always in charge. He was a good listener. Uh, quite surprisingly, as much as Wolf was a forceful presenter and speaker, uh, in conversation, Wolf was mostly a listener. He'd listen more, you know, and he'd provide a, a response, and he was very attentive to people when they spoke with him, and that was always, uh, always a pleasure. And, and he played his role of, uh, of last German professor to the hilt. I mean, he took pleasure, I think, in, uh, in, um, in taking up that role and playing it, and he, uh, I think he enjoyed his own eccentricities and particularly the reactions of people to those eccentricities. Somebody made an overhead uh, a sketch of him, a drawing, uh, to help people pronounce his name. So they had on it wolf, and a little picture of a wolf, ends, and they had hens, you know, burger, um, and they had a hamburger. And below that was a sketch of a wolf, literally on the run, with a bag over his shoulder. He had a big leather satchel that he carried all the time, his change agent bag, he called it, with an overhead in one hand and a screen in the other, running, you know. And um, I don't know that he was always running, but he was always on the move. <laughs> And he said one time that he got up at 4 o'clock in the morning, he didn't really want to, and he said to himself, Wolfie, if you're going to be a professor, you've got to get up and get your work done. <laughs> so he would get up when he had to. He would stay up as late as he had to to do what he had to do. He worked like a dog, and he was able to do that because his family supported him and in particular, my mother. He was a person who 
who always was the same rigorous, analytical, coherent, wise, truth-seeking, holy person. He was always that person at all times and in all places. He was a very complex man, full of contradictions. He was a very unusual man, a very great man, and also a difficult man in many sense. Many of the things Wolf supported, people were not happy about. It wasn't just one thing. It was, it was a whole bouquet, <laughs> so to speak. <laughs> but he knew he, was, he knew he was right. And you know, he probably in these instances was right. As time has, has gone along, you know, you say in the beginning, well, maybe he's right. And time tells us, in most cases, he's been right. What was interesting, though, was to see that other people didn't like him being able to do that, to make predictions that they didn't like hearing that news. They wanted to think that their systems, their efforts were going to be utopian, and he'd come along and say, this is deeply flawed because of these things, and it can't produce the things that you say it will. And so they didn't particularly, their sense was that people were in, you know, antagonistic because in a sense he wasn't a believer in what they believed in, you know, <laughs> because they hadn't done the analysis. And um, his ability to do that, I've never met anyone with that level of capacity. It was hard for him to be gentle with people in the sense that he wanted to get on to the important question and if it was an unimportant question, he tried to be nice, but sometimes his sort of impatience overcame him. He cared very much about what people thought about him. He didn't like being unpopular, as who does, but was prepared to make that sacrifice. He wanted to be loved by his audience, and he felt bad when people hated or made uh, bad remarks or were aggressive. But he, you need the courage. Uh, uh, and he was a very, very courageous man. You had to admire Wolf because he did live by his, he lived by his, his, his conviction. And it wasn't always easy. You know, he could have put his job, their livelihood, um, in jeopardy. And she supported him nonetheless. So um, I think especially early, in the early years where he was doing something so um, uh, different and uh, really poking the bear with a stick that, you know, there would have been a lot of spouses, and again, she was a traditional housewife, she wasn't working out of, out of the home, uh, who would not have supported that like she did. And she was behind him all the way. Those kind of convictions create enemies, and enemies can be very powerful. Not one uh, to be overly concerned about how people were reacting to him. He was not very political uh, or, or diplomatic at times. I mean, if you are such a great thinker, you think way out of the accepted ways of thinking about something that is really important, like disability. He was the outlier, but, but outliers often are kind of visionaries. He was a good man. He was a faithful man in many ways, faithful to promises and obligations, faithful, full of faith. He was one of those people who are just given to humanity at certain points in time, um, the right time and place, <laughs> and Wondrous things happen. Such a, an incredible, a meticulous way of researching. I mean, he just just went right, right to the bottom of everything, sort of thing. What made our relationship really good was his humor. His sense of humor was really great. We had some arguments. I can't remember now what the argument was about but we had this one really big argument and I, I um, ran out of the TI and sort of slammed the door and thought, I'm never talk to this man again. 
And um, then a few, um, maybe two, three weeks later, I got this comic strip in a, in a compass mail. And it was even the horrible or some like um, a Viking comic. And there was these two Vikings sitting in the boat and one Viking said to the other, why are the Viking women so difficult? <laughs> and the next time I saw Wolf, I said, well, I got your apology in the mail. And he just burst out laughing and, you know, we were really good friends again. He would burst into song um, at the weirdest times, frankly, but he knew so many different songs and he was very happy to share that. He was especially joyous when people would sing along with him. Uh, so uh, we, those of us who spent a lot of time with him, learned a lot of songs in German, some of which we really don't know what they are, but we sang along with him just to see that beautific look on his face. I think I'd really only been there for a few days before I fell in love with him. He just, uh, when you when you meet him personally, he's he's just very charming and has a great sense of humor, um, and he loved students. He really cared for people's learning, and he really cared for people. He had a wry, dry sense of humor. He, he could make a joke out of almost anything. And he laughed, uh, he laughed at others all the time. He laughed at himself all of the time. I can't remember specific jokes that he told, but just that he had this intense way about him. And then he would say something that would crack the room up. So he was able to just move from this really serious content into a, just an affable kind of fellow. He also... Um, um, his enjoyment of life was very instructive because he understood suffering. He understood it personally. He understood it for devalued people. And yet, he understood that that wasn't the whole story, that there's more to life than the hardships. Not that the hardships should be ignored. He never once ignored them. He embraced them, but he also embraced the beauty. And I'll always love that about him. And I think that's one of the things I always appreciate about Wolf too, that in a sense his whole life was of a piece. And it, was, it all made sense together. You know, his work, his teaching, his home life, his, his personal service he was offering, his faith life, um, the relationships that he had. One of the things I most um, admire about Wolf is that he's always been involved in the Syracuse community. So he's not just been an academic um, who has thought of this revolutionary radical principle and ideas and writings, but he's always been personally involved in the Syracuse community in a way that, that he is working to try to improve the lives of people who are devalued. Certainly his involvement with the Larsh community here, um, his involvement with the Yundi community, which was at first you know, a soup kitchen for homeless people, people on the streets, and he really was instrumental in helping people transform that kitchen into a much smaller community, the Unity community, that, um, you know, on the basis of thinking about valuing people who were street people and homeless people to, to give, you know, a quality meal with them within a community of people. And it was a radical transformation, you know, of that idea of a soup kitchen. And so Wolf was involved in that. He was fun, he, he was interesting, he, he he, God knows he read and he loved medieval lo and literature and he loved poetry and he, in the last years of his life, he read German poetry every night. I loved Wolf Wolfensperger. Every day, well, maybe not every day, but a good portion of it, of the time, I loved him with all my heart from the time I was 18 years old. And I never found a day with Wolf to be boring. Sometimes I prayed for boredom, but <laughs> he was—he was—he uh, was a interesting man. <laughs>